Can dietary sodium reduce gray hair? Let's see why that may be true. So first, resiniferatoxin, or RTX, causes hair grain. So on the left, we've got normal mice that were treated with saline, or physiological salt solution. And then, when mice are treated with RTX, you can see that there's gray hair now everywhere. Now this increase in hair grain that's caused by RTX occurs in conjunction with an increase for plasma levels of norepinephrine. And that's what we'll see here. So on the y-axis, we've got noradrenaline, which is just another name for norepinephrine, and then our two groups, control or saline-treated mice, and then the RTX-treated mice. And then we can see that in the RTX-treated mice, there was a more than tenfold increase for plasma levels of norepinephrine. Now, in terms of cause and effect, RTX caused hair graying, but the increase for plasma levels of norepinephrine is in association. So it went up in conjunction with the causation that was you know, caused by RTX. So what about causation, or can we get closer to causation? So starting off with mice that were treated with RTX and saline, so they had an abundance of gray hair, these mice were then treated with BUP, and BUP is buprenorphine. And I may be butchering the name, so apologies if I'm butchering the name. I'm just going to call it BUP from now on. But you can see what then when RTX-treated mice are treated with BUP, there's a reversal of hair graying. Gray hair is now gone. Now this elimination of the gray hair that was caused by RTX occurs in conjunction with a decrease for plasma levels of norepinephrine, which is what we'll see here. So once again, we've got noradrenaline or norepinephrine plotted on the y-axis. We've got our two groups in that more than tenfold increase in RTX-treated mice for plasma levels of norepinephrine. And then in RTX-treated mice that were also treated with BUP, we can see that plasma levels of norepinephrine are now at the same level that they were in controls in conjunction with a complete reversal of gray hair, no, no more gray hair. So this adds support to the hypothesis that plasma levels of norepinephrine are involved in mechanisms that impact hair grain. And the paper that I'm referencing, which I'll link to in the video's description, had a couple more mechanistic ways where they demonstrate a role for norepinephrine on hair graying, at least in mice. So if you're interested, I'd encourage checking out the paper in the video's description. So from these data, we can see that reducing plasma levels of norepinephrine is associated with gray hair reversal. And then the big question is, does this apply to people? So as we'll see, in people, plasma levels of norepinephrine increase during aging, and that's what we'll see here. And note that obviously, hair graying increases during aging, so this too is an association. On the y-axis, we've got plasma levels of norepinephrine, or PNE, and that's plotted against age. And in both women and men, we can see that there's a significant increase for plasma levels of norepinephrine during aging. As a correlation coefficient, lowercase r is around 0.5 for both women and men, and that p-value is less than 0.05. Now note that the lowercase n in the title is 314 people, which is a relatively small study. It's still bigger than 20 or 30 people, but still relatively small. So if anyone's come across how plasma levels of norepinephrine change during aging in much larger studies, please post it in the comments and I'd be happy to give you a shout out in a future video. Now on this plot, average plasma levels of norepinephrine in youth in 20 year olds are about 150 picograms per milliliter. And then in 70 year olds, it's higher, approximately double where it was in the 20 year olds, 300 to 350 picograms per, per milliliter, depending on if it's men or women. So could reducing plasma levels of norepinephrine when considering the, the mice data, the mouse data, could that reduce hair graying in people? And then that raises the question, what can decrease plasma levels of norepinephrine? One possibility may be dietary sodium, as dietary sodium reduces plasma levels of norepinephrine. And I should mention that the studies that I'm going to show are not association-based. These are causation, where people were given sodium amounts to consume, and then plasma levels of norepinephrine were measured in response. With the first study shown here, plasma levels of norepinephrine on the y-axis plotted against dietary sodium intake on the x. And then there were three groups, low, normal, and high levels of sodium intake. Low was 460 milligrams per day, normal 2760, and then high was 4600. And then we can see that plasma levels of norepinephrine were highest in the sodium-restricted or dietary sodium-restricted group, 
with values approxim approximating what the average values are in 70-year-olds, 300 to 350 picograms per mil. And this is just from having a low sodium, a low sodium diet. Now note that the people in this study were not 70-year-olds. They were 18 to 46-year-olds. So we can see that just a micronutrient like sodium, at, at least restricting it to very low levels, can reproduce the biochemical phenotype, at least in terms of plasma levels of norepinephrine that are found in older adults at younger ages. So this is bad news. All right, so what happens when dietary sodium intake was increased? So for the quote unquote normal dietary sodium intake of around 2,800 milligrams per day, there was a significant, as you can see, the p-value is less than 0.05, a significant decrease for plasma levels of norepinephrine, albeit still relatively high, around 250 picograms per mil. But then the largest reduction for plasma levels of norepinephrine were in the quote unquote high sodium group, 4,600 milligrams per day, and that caused a plasma norepinephrine level that was close to youthful, around 150 picograms per milliliter for plasma levels of norepinephrine. But the relationship between dietary sodium with plasma levels of norepinephrine may not be linear. So the data that I've shown here suggests that higher is better. The higher you go for sodium, the lower plasma levels of norepinephrine may be. And then if norepinephrine impacts hair graying in people, maybe that would reverse and or slow the rate of hair graying. But as we'll see in this plot, it's not a linear, it may not be a linear relationship for dietary sodium intake with plasma levels of norepinephrine. So on the y-axis, we've got plasma norepinephrine. And on the x, now we're looking at urine sodium levels. So urine excretion of sodium. And so I, I'm interested in intake, right? We want to know how can we impact plasma levels of norepinephrine by dietary changing or potentially changing dietary intake of sodium. So can we change or convert urine levels of sodium into an approximate dietary intake. So note that the data is in milli equivalents for urine sodium. One milli equivalent equals 23 milligrams of sodium. And then the other piece of information that we need for that conversion is that urine sodium equals approximately 90% of dietary intake. So if you have say a thousand milligrams of dietary intake, approximately 90% of that would be excreted with the urine sodium level of 900 milligrams, which you would then convert into milli equivalents dividing by 23. So using all of that data, we can now approximate the sodium intake for this study. So for 100, 200, and 300 milli equivalents for urine sodium, approximate dietary intake was about 2,600, double that, and then triple that for 300 milli equivalents of urine sodium per day. In terms of the highest plasma levels of norepinephrine, we can see that that was caused by the lowest, once again, the lowest dietary sodium intakes, around 1,300 milligrams per day. But then as dietary sodium increased and correspondingly as urine sodium levels increased, we can see that caused the lowest plasma levels of norepinephrine, closest to youthful. This is now around 200 picograms per milliliter. And I should say, I skipped over it, but the plasma levels of norepinephrine that was caused by around 1,300 milligrams of dietary sodium this is more than double what the average value was in the last study. So this is a super high amount of plasma levels of norepinephrine. And here in this study, this wasn't older adults. Here too, it was relatively young people, 20 to 45 years old. So restricting sodium or having a very low sodium diet may lead to plasma norepinephrine levels that are super high, values you'd expect to find in advanced age or older. I mean, 600 picograms per mil is even older than the average values of the last study that included 70-year-olds. Uh, All right, so we saw that the lowest plasma norepinephrine levels were caused by sodium intakes around 3,800 milligrams per day. But then as dietary sodium increased, we can see that that too increased plasma levels of norepinephrine. So around 6,400 milligrams of dietary sodium per day, that caused a plasma norepinephrine level of around 400 picograms per mil. Again, data that you'd expect to find in 70-year-olds, not 20 to 45-year-olds. So from this study, we can see that there is a U-shaped, or there may be a U-shaped association for urine sodium with plasma levels of, of norepinephrine. And I say there may be because in the previous study it was linear, and in this study it may be U-shaped, where too low and too high may be bad. So when considering the findings from this study, should relatively higher amounts of dietary sodium, should that be a daily target? In this case, 3,800 milligrams per day. So now for more context, because if the goal is to reverse hair graying, hair 
having gray hair isn't going to kill you. But on the other hand, blood pressure is a risk factor for heart disease and increasing sodium intake increases blood pressure, which is what we'll see here. This is a meta-analysis of 11 studies where people either increased or decreased their sodium intake and the corresponding change on systolic blood pressure. In this study, there was no change on diastolic blood pressure, at least in people who did not have hypertension at baseline. Hypertension being defined as 130 over 80 for SBP, systolic over diastolic. And I didn't include the data for people who have hypertension or high blood pressure because in the longevity community, I imagine most of us have blood pressures 130 over 80 or lower. So that's the data that I'm going to focus on in this video. So on the y-axis, we've got the systolic blood pressure change and that's plotted against sodium intake in grams per day. In terms of what's significant, we put up a red line at a SBP difference of zero. And now when the dashed black lines, that's the 95% confidence interval, when that's above zero or completely below zero, we have a significant effect or a significant association. And then we can see that as sodium intakes are reduced below two grams per day, that's associated with a significant reduction for systolic blood pressure. Now, granted, the, the effect size on that is not very large. It's only about three units, three milligrams of mercury. But still, it illustrates that relatively lower sodium may be better for a lower systolic blood pressure. On the other hand, going above two grams of sodium per day was significantly associated with a higher systolic blood pressure. And note that that data is going in the wrong direction because systolic blood pressure increases during aging. So it suggests that the higher our dietary sodium intake, the higher our blood pressure, which may be bad for heart disease mortality risk. So now we've got this conundrum. How much sodium should we eat? You know, on the one hand, we've got potentially higher blood pressure, but on the other hand, we're reversing an age-related phenotype, gray hair. So the American Heart Association recommends 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams per day. And on the one hand, a low sodium diet may, res may result in lower systolic blood pressure and a reduced cardiovascular disease risk. And as I mentioned, on the other hand though, higher sodium intake, at least higher than 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams per day, that may lower plasma levels of norepinephrine and that may result in less gray hair or slowing the rate of hair grain. But there's another variable that we can measure in this, in this system and that's heart rate variability and resting heart rate, HRV and RHR. And we'll see why that's the case here. So resting heart rate and heart rate variability are heart localized measures, but their levels are influenced by many factors, including the balance between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, in this case, as illustrated by the vagus nerve. But also note that sympathetic nerves and the adrenal gland release norepinephrine, which then can impact resting heart rate and heart rate variability. So now collectively, we have a new question how much sodium may be best for potentially slowing hair grain and optimizing heart rate variability and resting heart rate without messing up blood pressure or other biomarkers. So I try not to be reductionist. You know, if I only looked at the data in isolation, I'd go on a relatively high sodium diet, reduce plasma levels of norepinephrine, and then if that impacts mechanisms related to gray hair in people, you know, I just, I just you know, I'm all, I'm all good. I, I don't have to think about it, right? But I'm interested in systemic health. I'm not interested in one, optimizing one variable and forgetting about everything else. I want to have the lowest risk approach, you know, a local minimum where I get the maximum effect for a multitude of biomarkers, not just one. So with that in mind, up until July 14th, my average sodium intake in 2025, and note that I, tr for those who don't know, I track diet every day with a food scale. I then enter that data into chronometer and then into a spreadsheet. So I have all of my dietary data closely detailed going back to 2015. So average daily sodium intake in 2025, starting on January 1st, 1600 milligrams per day, relatively low. Now I'd expect that plasma levels of norepinephrine, in my case, on that low sodium, relatively low sodium diet may be high. So why don't I just measure, right? Well, the norepinephrine test by itself, at least on ultalabtest.com, which is where, <laughs> so apologies for the plug, but where I get the majority of my blood tests done. And if you want to use it yourself, there's an affiliate link in the video description. Norepinephrine's test on its own is about $250. I'm currently measuring by venipuncture eight times per year. So just measuring norepinephrine is going to be $2,000 on its own, which is not, 
you know, it's, it's not nickels. You know, I can use that money for other things and get a lot more data. And some of those biomarkers include heart rate variability, resting heart rate that I can get, you know, for a lot cheaper cost. Average heart rate variability and resting heart rate in 2025 is 5843, which is better than chronological age expected. And I've covered this in earlier videos. But for those who are familiar with the channel and have covered my story in trying to, you know, science the sh out of aging, this is actually uh, my worst data going back three or four years. So compared to 2023 and 2024, 5843 is worse. And I should say there are a few fa there are a few factors that went into that. I'm due for an update video on this story. I've kind of flipped it where now heart rate variability and resting heart rate have started to move back towards my best data, which was 2023, 2024. So stay tuned for that in an upcoming video. And then blood pressure over 69 different, day, different days of tracking thus far in 2025, average values are relatively youthful, 115 over 69. So that's on a relatively low sodium diet. But then after July 15th, when considering that on workout days, I'd expect that there's an increase in sympathetic nerve activation because the workout is a stressor. Granted, it's a hormetic stressor, which in the short term may be bad for physiologic metrics like heart rate variability and resting heart rate, but we adapt chronically so that they improve over time. Now, a part of that equation probably is norepinephrine as, as indicated on the plot, where norepinephrine increases as a response in a response to exercise or moderate to vigorous exercise. But then note that maybe there's an overshoot because if my dietary sodium intake is relatively low and plasma norepinephrine is higher than it should be on a workout day, well, maybe my recovery will be slower than it should be. And then that delays when the next workout can happen. And then that slows potential fitness gains over time. So I'm going to test that hypothesis by going higher for dietary sodium intake on workout days, approximately double where I've been for a very long time, 2,800 to 3,000 milligrams per day. Now, I don't know what's optimal yet. I don't have a lot of data for dietary sodium intakes in that range higher than 2,000 milligrams per day going back 10 years. So I'm going to have to collect a lot of data in the 1,600 to 3,000 milligram per day of sodium range and see what may be best, not just for heart rate variability and resting heart rate, but also for blood pressure. And then if that happens to reduce gray hair, that's just a bonus. That's At least that's how I see it. Now on the non-workout days, because I'd expect less plasma norepinephrine because I'm not doing a moderate to vigorous workout, I'm aiming lower for sodium intake, around 2,000 to 2,400 milligrams per day. And again, I don't know if those are going to be the values that I settle on long term. We've got to see how this story plays out and affects on blood pressure, heart rate variability, and resting heart rate. And again, if I see a benefit on gray hair, that's a cherry on top. If you've ever wondered what's optimal for biomarkers, well, I have a new Patreon tier dedicated just to that. It currently includes these 33 biomarkers as shown here, more than two hours of video content collected from 48 published references. All of that data is in the tier. And I should mention that these aren't the reference ranges which you can get from any LLM or chatbot these days. This is what may be optimal for how each of these biomarkers changes during aging and or their association with all-cause mortality risk. And that's in the largest epidemiological studies that I can find. These aren't studies of 20 people. These are millions to sometimes 15 million people in the study. So if you're interested in that, check it out. And if you're interested in more of my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon, where I post at least twice per day. Before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself that help support the channel including ultalabtest.com, which I mentioned, I get the majority of my blood tests done there, the clearly filtered water filter, which I'm using every day, at-home metabolomics, or up to 18, actually 19 tests, I tested yesterday again, oral microbiome composition, NAD testing with Ginfinity, epigenetic testing with True Diagnostic, at-home blood testing with Cypox Health, which includes the best epigenetic clock, at least in terms of all of the epigenetic clocks, how it compares to things like PhenoAge, nobody's done that comparison, but GrimAge is included on the Cypox panel, green tea, drinking it every day, diet tracking with chronometer, as I mentioned in the video, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got new merch, including data is my North star, figuring stuff out is my drug, which I've got on here and the channel theme conquer aging or die trying. So if you're interested in that link in the video's description, thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.